I'm sure he's up for the challenge. So. I'd like to ask you all to please come in and uh, take your seats. There are lots of seats down here, and it's always nice for a speaker to have people close by to look at, not just people uh, up the hill. So I'd encourage you to come down. Uh, so my name is Rich Goldberg. I'm the uh, Cancer Institute Director, uh, and uh, this afternoon is a real pleasure. Uh, so we're capping off a day that started at 8 o'clock this morning with uh, the first annual uh, Cancer Institute scientific meeting. We had some outside speakers, and then I hope some of you were able to join us for the dedication uh, where uh, the governor... Uh, entertained us with an interesting story about a dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, now we're here for the Hardesty Lecture, which is the capstone of our day. Uh, and sitting up in front here, we have uh, Susan and David. Uh, David, as you know, was the president of the university and continues to be an active faculty member. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, he helped to uh, MC a retreat that we had for the Cancer Institute. Uh, and did a wonderful job uh, both organizing it and running it. He's both a, uh, a student and a teacher of strategic planning, and so that was very helpful to us. Uh, and this lectureship is given in honor of the Hardesties by their friends. Uh, and I understand it hasn't always been uh, done, but it will be on my watch, I can promise you. Uh, so we're delighted, uh, delighted to have them here uh, to be honored. Uh, and then uh, it's also a special honor for me to introduce my friend and colleague, Ned Sharpless. So Ned and I met uh, soon after I came to UNC. He got there ahead of me. He was a first-year faculty member. Uh, he grew up in North Carolina, went to UNC both for undergraduate and medical school, and then spent about 10 years at Harvard uh, and came back to West Virginia uh, where he was a clinical physician taking care of people with heme malignancies, uh, was a uh, researcher, uh, and, uh, and also a teacher. And after I left uh, UNC, he became the head of the Cancer Institute. Uh, during the time that he was at Harvard, he worked with Ron DePino, who subsequently became the head of MD Anderson, and he told me last night that... Uh, when the Trump administration was looking for a new NCI director, they called Ron DePino, and Ron said, oh, you ought to talk to Ned Sharpless, and, and here he is. So uh, Ron was the kingmaker, and the king is here. Uh, so Ned has done the research, he's done the education, he's done the clinical care, and now he's determining where the billions of dollars that the national government and uh, infuses into cancer research is deployed. Uh, what an awesome responsibility, what an awesome opportunity. Uh, and he's doing that informed by his patient care experiences and his laboratory experiences, and also having founded uh, several companies. So uh, he understands the process uh, from beginning to end. Uh, and he's going to regale us uh, with a lecture about uh, the power of possibility. Good afternoon. Um, it's great, great to come up. Thank you for having me. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, add my congratulations to the Hardesties. What, what a wonderful event. And, and I've spent a day at this university. I can see what a special place it is. And I, I can tell your fingerprints are all over it. So congratulations, uh, David and Susan. Round of applause for them. I'd like to thank uh, Clay and, and Richard for hosting a great day and, and allowing me to meet some exciting people and, and a lot of lively and stimulating conversations. I, I sort of wondered why my old friend Richard Goldberg was the first person to email me when it was announced that I was going to be NCI director inviting me for a visit to come meet his friends, the, the governor and the congressman. Uh, <laughs> now, now I, 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 I suspect I know why now. But uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, really, uh, it, 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 it's a palpable sense of excitement here around cancer. And, uh, and, and this is a state that has a, a large burden of cancer. And so I, I think it's a, a wonderful a movement we have going here to get great leadership around cancer research and cancer care 
and develop a world-class cancer institute. I think that's a, a wonderful vision that the NCI shares with this, with this university. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit about uh, patient care and what I learned from taking care of patients and, and how that's informed my thinking about being an NCI director. So I, I wasn't always a federal official. I uh, didn't always wear a tie to work. I, uh, in fact, if I even close my eyes, I can remember without much effort at all my last day of medical school, the, the day I graduated from the University of North Carolina. And it was a day that, you know, a lot, a lot happened. There were diplomas and a bunch of family members showed up and, uh, you know, there were hugs and tears and a, a bucket of dubious fried chicken. And, uh, but one of the things I did that day was I, like many physicians, I think most physicians now when they graduate from an American medical school, recite the physician's oath, which is uh, based on the Hippocratic Oath. It's sort of modified version. The Hippocratic Oath, as many of you know, is 2,000 years old, 2,000 plus years old. And, it, and the, the physician's oath has a, a bunch of uh, solemn commitments to certain principles of being a good physician. You know, one of them is that the physician takes care of a, of a patient, not a disease. Another is that physicians are supposed to say, I don't know. They're supposed to ask for help when they uh, encounter a situation they don't know exactly how to handle. That, that part has served me well in federal government. Uh, physicians are supposed to share knowledge. They're supposed to be teachers. They're supposed to instruct their patients and other doctors. And then there's this last line that I've always kind of kept with me, which is that, I, and it goes like this, may I long experience the joy of healing uh, those who seek my help. And that, that is... Uh, really an important line. And I, I think sometimes in oncology, we forget about that. You know, how much joy is in patient care and in, in cancer. And that's really what drove me to the practice of medicine. When, when, and, when, and when, as a doctor, as a cancer, as an oncologist, I became frustrated that often my ability to heal my patients was, was not adequate. That, that, that pursuit of this joy of healing is what led me actually back to the lab to do cancer science, to find out answers to how we can make better therapies for patients with cancer. And so as a physician and a researcher, I've gotten to see how these two worlds work together. And so I'll, I'll honor my commitment to share information with others and, and talk about that. And I specifically like to do it within the context of a couple of patients. So I'm going to talk about three patients that I took care of and sort of what they taught me and how that information has uh, influenced how I think about cancer research and what the National Cancer Institute should do. And, uh, and I, I will say, um, before I dive in, though, one times it is, it is uh, surprising to people who haven't been cancer doctors. You know, I, I think it's obvious that being an oncologist can be a hard job, right? I mean, you get attached to these patients. You take care of them for a very long time. Uh, many of them have terrible outcomes, and it, it's, it's, it's challenging. And I think every first-year oncology fellow has felt uh, that both the, 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 you know, the joy and the of, 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 of intense patient care but it's also important to say that medical oncology is surprisingly rewarding. It's a really wonderful career, and it actually can even be fun. I mean, I, I think uh, you have these patients have good outcomes, that's fun, and then they come back and see you and have are cured of their cancer, that's fun. And, and even under pretty terrible circumstances, patients can show this dignity and this, and, and this behavior that is, 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 is very rewarding. And, and I, I remember some patients can really have a great sense of humor. I once took care of a lady with leukemia who, uh, you know, the, key, the treatment for leukemia is fairly intensive chemotherapy. So she was uh, really treated heavily and eventually cured of her disease. But she had this problem that's not that uncommon with chemotherapy where the chemotherapy kind of ruined the taste of all food. And she developed this very profound desire to not eat. You know, she became incredibly anorexic, uh, but, you know, not that kind of anorexia, but you know, chemotherapy-induced anorexia, and, uh, and lost a bunch of weight and became very weak and debilitated. We tried lots of stuff to help her you know, regain her appetite, and nothing really worked. And I remember her coming in for one visit, and we were sort of wheeled in by And she looked terrible. I mean, she was frail and you know, propped on one hand, and, and I was very concerned about her. And you know, I said, Ms. John, how are you doing? And she, she said, well, Dr. Sharpless, I would really like to thank you for this great weight loss program you've put me on. <laughs> and, and I was, I mean, it was, I mean she was really uh, looked uh, uh, astonishingly bad, but yet despite those circumstances was still quite witty and a lot of fun. So it's really a privilege to take care of, patient, care of patients with cancer. It can be fun and it can also teach you a lot. So cancer is um, incredibly informative to take care of these patients. 
And uh, so I'd like to talk about what these three patients taught me. So the first patient I'd like to talk about is uh, someone I met in 19, when I was what's called a oncology fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. So that's the first year of like cancer doctor training. I'd done my internal medicine training uh, for three years and now I was a, a, a would-be cancer specialist. And night, those of you who remember the, the late 1990s, that was the height of the AIDS epidemic. So uh, it's just hard to tell young doctors today what it was like back then. I mean, half of an internal medicine service in those days in a big city like Boston would be patients dying of, of AIDS. They, in the most baroque, gothic ways imaginable with these terrible infections of, with organisms we'd never heard of. And, uh, you know, things that like, like we thought of as a bread mold or something could make you sick. I mean, it was really uh, an, an unbelievably difficult uh, time because it, it was so new. There was a constant struggle with these new clinical situations that we'd never dealt with. And we re learned how important the immune system was to keep all these infections at bay. And it was, uh, 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 you know, it was a lot of young patients and a lot of patients who were from certain vulnerable populations and it was just a dark time in American medicine. And I remember one young man I took care of who had been a well person. He had not thought of himself as sick. He'd never been ill. And he came to um, uh, the hospital because he was having trouble breathing. And uh, he did not know he was HIV positive at that time. And he went from being you know, someone who thought of himself as a well individual to critically ill, life-threatening ill in just a moment. And he was rapidly diagnosed first with this disease called pneumocystis pneumonia. This is a weird organism that didn't really cause illness until the AIDS epidemic. And that caused him to be intubated. So he needed a breathing tube, so he couldn't even talk to us. And uh, we treated that and he got a bit better and he was extubated and could finally tell us about his terrible headaches he was having. So he then had a lumbar puncture and turned out to have a disease called cryptococcal meningitis which was another AIDS-defining illness nobody had ever really taken care of before. And so he's been diagnosed with two extremely rare problems within two days of each other. And uh, we start treating that, and he starts feeling better from that. And then somebody notices he has all these big lymph nodes, and one of those gets biopsied, and it turns out he has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, an AIDS-defining illness as well, at least uh, this, this subtype of it. And that's how I got involved. So they consulted the oncology service to come meet this person. And... Uh, I remember uh, I had never taken care of such a patient. There wasn't a lot of literature on how to treat lymphoma in patients with AIDS at that time. And uh, I was a fellow in training, and so this was an interesting educational opportunity. I read up on HIV lymphoma. I talked to uh, one of the great lymphoma doctors I've ever worked with, Mike Grossbart, who was at that time my attending. And we sort of thought about this a lot, and we decided he was way too sick for standard therapy. We couldn't give him the heavy doses of drug we normally would in this situation. So we kind of found this unusual regimen and we cut the dose in half and we gave him this therapy and uh, it was marvelous. I mean, his cancer melted away. And I remember Mike and I think we were so self-congratulatory. We were so <laughs> impressed by the response. We were uh, really clever. We were already figuring out how we were gonna write this guy up as a case report. And uh, you know, HIV, it has to be said, taught us a lot. I mean, there's so much retrovirology we know today. There's so much immunology we know today that we didn't know back then. I mean, AIDS was a tremendous teacher of biomedical research, but it was a harsh teacher. And it taught some of those lessons in a very terrible way. And in this particular instance, the, the lesson it taught me was when this guy, you know, was, his cancer was essentially cured, but he developed sepsis about a month into therapy and died promptly from that because his immune system was shot. He, we had treated the, the cancer, but not the patient, right? So that's that thing I already mentioned, that we treat a patient, not a disease. It doesn't really benefit someone if we make their cancer go away and we don't make them better. And so that was one of the lessons I learned from this patient. I learned another lesson from this patient, though, that only becomes obvious in the context of time. And that if you close your eyes and think about this patient I took care of 21 years ago, and what would happen with him today, you realize how much times have changed. I mean, the if we saw this guy today, the therapy would be much better. 
We have drugs like rituximab that are much better. We have a regimen called EPOC that was developed by Wyndham Wilson at the NCI that's better. We would, you know, sequence this tumor and molecularly characterize it. We know these tumors are largely caused by Epstein-Barr virus now. We know a lot more about the cancer, but most importantly, this guy would probably never get lymphoma in the first place because we have highly active antiretroviral therapy, right? So we have all these great drugs, which didn't exist back then, that have made HIV lymphoma really rare in the United States now. So we have made an unbelievable amount of progress in that topic. In just 21 years, we've totally transformed that disease and its therapy and its prognosis. So it is a, um, a, it shows you what can happen. You know, that's how fast cancer research can go. We can make great progress in short bits of time. Uh, the next patient I'd like to talk about is, is someone I took care of in North Carolina in, in 2010. She was in her mid-20s. I think she was 24. And she was a Hispanic woman who didn't speak much English. And she uh, came to our hospital, to the emergency room, for chest pain and having trouble breathing and was admitted to our inpatient oncology service because she had a scary-looking chest X-ray. And that was biopsied, and it turned out that she had lung cancer. And this was very odd, because this was a young woman, 24 years old, who had never smoked cigarettes. So that was a strange presentation for lung cancer. Uh, she was stabilized on the inpatient service and uh, thought about for a little while, and then started on routine chemotherapy for lung cancer, carboplatin taxol, for those of you who are fans, and sent back home, where she was going to get cyclic chemotherapy. You know, every three weeks, she'd come in and get another round of treatment. And uh, I wasn't involved in her original care. I met her a couple of months into her therapy when she came in for her fifth cycle of this regimen, carboplatin taxol. And I was doing what we called the doc of the day, which meant that I would staff the fellows patients. I would, I would sign their chemotherapy orders. You know, we'd see these patients who were getting established therapy and make sure they were doing okay and then give them their next round of therapy. And so I remember this young oncologist in training came to me and said, uh, yeah, here's this patient that we have who's getting treated for lung cancer, and she's 24, and she never smoked, and sign here. <laughs> and he sort of handed me these chemotherapy orders to sign. I was like, wait, 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 did you say 24 years old? And he said, yes. And I said, did you say never smoked? And he said, yes. And I said, well, that, that's not right. I mean, that's, that's really unusual. What, what did you think was going on? Did you sequence her for this gene called EGFR? you know, which was we knew about back then. We had approved therapy, or in 2011, the, the therapy was approved, but it was well into clinical testing. And he said, yeah, we did that. We thought of that. She didn't have that, so, you know, she's getting this regimen. Oh, and by the way, it was also clear the chemotherapy that had worked for a while and helped her was not working anymore. So it was sort of time to start thinking about what to do next when this regimen no longer worked. And so then I asked, well, did you sequence the other genes? Did you se sequence ALK and ROS1 and these other things? And I remember the, the fellow kind of looked at me and said, what's ALK? And I said, oh. Well, let me tell you, because I'm a scientist. I'm in the lab a lot, and I had been in a meeting a week before my colleague Jeff Engelman, who's now of Novartis, but at that time was at Sloan Kettering. And Jeff was one of the people who pioneered the use of ALK inhibitors for uh, ALK-translocated lung cancer. And this is a rare kind of lung cancer. It's sort of a couple of percent of patients, but they tend to be younger. They tend to be women, for reasons we don't understand, and they tend to be non-smokers. So uh, she had the sort of demographics of an ALK-translocated patient. And the important thing to know is uh, a drug was being developed for a different purpose, but it realized during its clinical testing, the company realized that it was actually an ALK inhibitor. So they rapidly, as this entity became known, they rapidly shunted patients to that trial with this kind of lung cancer. And we had that trial open at the University of North Carolina. Although no one thought of that drug as an ALK inhibitor, we thought at that time thought of it as a different kinase inhibitor, a MET inhibitor. So um, I you know, gave him my little scientific speech that I was pleased with, having knowing all about this. and. Uh, and we gave her that cycle of carboplatin taxol because we needed something to do uh, to temporize her. And then we sent her tumor off for this, the sequencing of these events. And at that time, this was not routinely available. So we had to get you know, the block and send it off to some special lab. And it took a long time. And about five or six weeks later, it finally the result comes back. And she has a beautiful, uh, classic, you know, defining mutation, translocation of ALK. She's exactly the kind of patient we were looking for and that was the day that she had become so sick from her lung cancer that we stopped treating her and enrolled her in hospice. So the molecular diagnostics would have helped her, but it was too late. And important to know, uh, we, now, we didn't know then, but we now know that ALK inhibitors in that kind of lung cancer are about the most effective single agent we have ever seen in lung cancer. 
you know, for that kind of lung cancer. If you have that kind of disease, an ALK inhibitor will not cure you usually, but it can make you live years, you know, five years longer, not unusual. So I don't think we would have been able to cure that woman had she come in today, but we certainly would have been able to do much better than we did. And I found this very, oh, and I, I should make one, make one other thing. You know, I don't think she got in any sense bad care. She got care. She got what she would have gotten at any other institution in the country pretty much at that time with a few, you know, exceptions. And, uh, but the point is, is that the standard of care is sometimes not very good care and certainly wasn't good care for a young 24 year old woman with like three kids at home. So I was very frustrated by this. I remember uh, thinking that, you know, these are gonna, this is gonna happen again. We're gonna have these patients, they're gonna come here, they're gonna have mutations that we can treat. We're not gonna identify them, we're gonna give them, you know, the standard of care, which may not be good care. And uh, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna prevent that from happening? And so I did a couple of things. I was just at that time getting a leadership position in the cancer center. And so I was in a position to kind of organize uh, how we thought about cancer. And one of the things we did, right away that's a real process issue but was important was we made this kind of testing reflex so if someone had a new diagnosis of lung cancer the pathologist wouldn't have to think about it they would just test for egfr and alk and these other things but another thing that we did that took a bit longer but that i was really proud of was we uh, started sequencing lots of patients so we started this protocol called you and seek and this was something that uh, I, I helped develop with my colleague neil hayes who's now at Memphis, but uh, Neil was a, a, a fine cancer doctor, but also a really good cancer geneticist. My original proposal was we would just sequence all the genes and everybody, and Neil explained to me that was too expensive and we wouldn't know what to do with all the data anyway. So we culled it down to a sort of panel of about 300 genes we would sequence in everybody when they'd have cancer. So we would find these kinds of patients. And uh, that went on, we went on to sequence 3,000 patients. And importantly, we, not just, we didn't just sequence them, but we actually followed them to find out what happened to them. And we gave the results of our sequencing, and this was what really was really innovative about our trial at the time, was we not only you know, kept the results for science and retrospective use, but we prospectively sent the results to the patients and their doctors. So that if there was an event found that was meaningful, the, the, the patient could change therapy. So we learned a lot scientifically, we published a lot of papers. I think we helped some patients with cancer, but it all started because of a, a real tragedy, a, a, a bad outcome in a, in a patient that I told you about. So what did this patient teach me? Well, first, just like the first patient, if you close your eyes and think about 2010 versus 2018, you realize again how fast cancer progress is. If this patient came in today to virtually any hospital in the United States, she gets sequenced for not three genes, but like hundreds of genes for you know 10 or more driving events uh, that all have therapeutic implications in lung cancer automatically. The results of that test come back in three days, not two months. And then she is eligible to get a therapy that will help her a lot. Uh, and in some cases, in some types of lung cancer, we think we're even curing some of those patients now in the metastatic setting with immunotherapy. So our, our ability to treat non-small cell lung cancer has improved markedly in the last eight years. So, you know, lesson one. Oh, and another thing worth mentioning is that testing, that, that, that sequencing I talked about, the government will now pay for that. CMS has decided they cover next gen sequencing for this. So it's so clearly a good idea that um, the government has said we'll even support this, which means it's available. There's no research need or, or anything like that, as long as you're a Medicare patient. So um, that was you know, one thing I learned, that uh, you know, cancer progress is really fast when you step back and look for a minute. Another thing I learned though, is that we really can't accept the status quo. You know, when patients like this present to us, we have to fight for them, we have to advocate for them, we have to you know, continuously work for them to provide the best care possible and not be satisfied with a standard of care if it's not good care. And we have to do this for all our patients. We have to do this for our rich VIP donors, but we also have to do this, why is Siri talking to me? But we also have to do this for, the, for patients like this patient who are poor and don't speak English. We have to provide great care hospital. The third patient I'd like to talk about, I took care of just a few years ago in 2016 at the University of North Carolina. And as Richard mentioned, I used to treat acute leukemia on the inpatient service. And this was a guy who was a, a, a very charming 60 year old African American man who lived in Durham. And he was a father and a husband and a journalist. And he was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia, AML, 
And AML in a 60-year-old is generally a pretty bad disease. And I felt like when I met him, even though he was this great life, I, I had was pretty convinced even before I, you know, bone marrow biopsy, just look, by looking at his bone, bone marrow smear, I was pretty convinced he was going to have an incurable cancer. And I was preparing to tell him and his wife about how, you know, this was a, a really tough disease. He was going to need this very aggressive, you know, therapy. If he was lucky, we might be able to get him into a bone marrow transplant, which had, was the only chance of cure. And that was a very slim chance. And then we did his bone marrow biopsy. And to all our surprise, he came back with what's called good cytogenetics. So the bone marrow is tested for the cytogenetic abnormalities that drive the cancer. And, you know, in someone who's 60, most of the news you get from cytogenetics is bad, you know, adverse cytogenetics. A few patients will have intermediate cytogenetics. And rarely, very rarely, will someone have good cytogenetics, which he did, meaning his prognosis was good with standard therapy, meaning he would just get kind of usual chemotherapy. He wouldn't need a bone marrow transplant. And he had a pretty good chance of being cured. So we treated him with that. And I remember the day I got to, you know, and I had, I had sort of, in managing expectations, sort of prepared he and his family for the worst possible news. And, and then I got to go in and tell them the results of their bone marrow was actually surprisingly good. And I remember uh, what, a, what a lovely moment. You know, his two adult daughters were there and they were crying and happy and his wife was crying and happy and the patient was a little overwhelmed. But it was, it was a moment. We treated that guy with standard chemotherapy and it wasn't very terribly difficult. And then he uh, promptly went into remission. Most of his treatment was out of the hospital and he's uh, in remission now. And I had coffee with him two weeks ago when he came to visit me at the NIH. And uh, this uh, patient taught me something really important, which is, you know, well, first of all, it makes the point about molecularly precise therapy that, you know, our clinical decision-making can be informed by cancer by having the diagnostic molecular information. And that is a real movement in cancer. No two patients are alike. We really have to understand the molecular biology of everybody's cancer to treat them right. But the other thing it taught me is that um, sometimes things turn out much better than you expect in cancer. This is a patient where I expected the worst and one of those patients where I personally liked him but, uh, and was prepared for a you know, pretty bad outcome and uh, he's doing great. And, and, and that motivated me and that continues to motivate me now and surprise me. So, you know, let me sum up these lessons here. I've learned that cancer progress happens really fast. I've learned not to accept the status quo. I've learned that a decent outcome, you know, the standard of care might not be good care. I've learned that we have to keep pressing and fighting. And I've learned that sometimes we'll be pleasantly surprised and that we should always keep hope. So, you know, what has this meant for me now as I've become NCI director? So the National Cancer Institute is a $6 billion a year cancer research organization. It has 3,000 employees that are full-time equivalents and then a, a, a probably even larger number of contractors we use. Uh, and this, these lessons have shaped how I think about how those resources should be deployed. These lessons have shaped how I talk to Congress. And I have to tell them why, although we're making a lot of progress for cancer and outcomes for patients with cancer are better than ever, we still have a long way to go. We have frustratingly little progress in certain diseases like pancreatic cancer and glioblastoma where we need to do better. And uh, the NCI's, oh, I'm sorry, these lessons have helped me remember that uh, the NCI's work is really for the patients. Our job is to make cancer less devastating, less tragic, less miserable. And anything we do that's not aimed at that goal is not a good use of our resources. Every one of these patients that I mentioned would have had a better outcome today, even 1997 or 2010 or 2016. And improvements are still happening that rapidly, but we still have a way to go. So given that, you know, what is, what, is, what are my plans for the NCI against this background of being a physician? Well, first I think it has to be said that it's a great time to be a cancer researcher in the United States. We have had a terrific influx of new ideas, this new understanding of cancer, the biology of cancer, new therapeutic ideas, great new technology that affects surgery and radiation oncology and imaging and uh, medical oncology. And uh, these have uh, really been uh, wonderful armamentarium for cancer. And additionally, we have this great support from Congress. So there's uh, broad 
bipartisan support for biomedical research in the United States, and particularly for cancer research. And, and this is uh, really great. It, it is undoubtedly an interesting time in the nation's capital. Uh, but um, I get to walk around and talk to congressmen and women quite a lot. And everybody I meet, regardless of political affiliation, seems interested in helping the National Cancer Institute. There is no congressperson who doesn't have constituents in their district that have been touched by cancer. And so everybody wants to see how we can do better and wants to support the effort. And I get routinely asked by people in Congress, how can we help the NCI? What can we do for the war on cancer? So one of the things I, I so it, it's a great time for a, a cancer research in the United States because of this commitment and because of these new ideas and because of this sense of progress. And that uh, has created some, what I like to call good problems for the NCI. It's created some challenges for us because we are uh, being met with increased expectations. And the sense of progress is, one has to build on that. And also, our fundees are submit, submitting more and more grants. We're getting lots and lots of great ideas to the NCI, but that means that we can fund a smaller and smaller proportion of them. And that causes frustration for the community in the form of diminished pay lines for, for, for funding. I will say, you know, one of the things I did when I became NCI director was I went around and I spoke to sort of everyone that I could talk to about the NCI. I did a six month learning and listening tour. And I spoke to patients, I spoke to advocates, I spoke to doctors, I spoke to scientists, I spoke to federal officials, I spoke to former federal officials, I spoke to every living uh, former NCI director. And I heard a lot about what the NCI does well and about what the National Cancer Institute could do better. And we, we quickly appreciated that there were uh, areas where the NCI was well suited to help make progress. You know, we couldn't do everything. There are things that are not a good fit for the National Cancer Institute. There are things that are better fit for other types of funders or industry. But there are some things where the NCI is, is really important and plays an almost unmatched role. And that led to these sort of key focus areas we identified. So the, the first is developing our workforce. I would argue the most important thing the does is train the next generation of cancer scientists and cancer doctors. And, but I would also point out that we spend a lot of money on training. The training grant portfolio is large from the NCI. And therefore, it's really incumbent upon us to look at that support and make sure we're training doctors for the right things. We're teaching them the right skill set to be successful cancer researchers in the future. Uh, we've done a few things that are worth mentioning. We've put this big focus into funding early stage investigators. We've uh, this R37, that's a seven year award or a potentially seven year award for uh, young faculty getting the first uh, large grant from the NCI. Uh, we've really focused on um, these research experiences to try and make sure people get training and things like immuno oncology and big data, these areas that we think are gonna be big in the future. A second real focus area, it's almost surprising that I have to say this, but is a, is a, is a sort of full-throated and continued commitment to basic science research. The reason we have this, you know, the NCI has always been about good basic science research, but the reason that one still has to point that out today is because of this success I talked about. You know, if you're home watching TV, you'll see an ad for these marvelous new checkpoint inhibitors that are curing certain patients with melanoma and, and uh, lung cancer. And that's great. I mean, that, that, you know, melanoma was, was, metastatic melanoma was about the worst cancer I could imagine back when I was a fellow. And now I feel like we're curing a lot of those patients, maybe even the majority of those patients. And I said curing, I mean, making their cancer go away and never come back. So that's incredible progress. But if you're a patient sitting at home and you have pancreatic adenocarcinoma or uh, glioblastoma, or God forbid your child has pediatric brain cancer, then you're going to ask, where's the progress for the disease I care about? Why are my loved ones or why am I still dying of cancer when there's been this great progress? And maybe the NCI isn't focused enough on my disease. And so we get a lot of requests, you know, drop what you're doing and spend a lot of money in this area on the clinical trial in this disease that I care about. And I get that. I understand why people want the National Cancer Institute of seeing this uneven progress. But I also uh, think the worst thing we could do is support a clinical trial that's not you know, predicated by the best basic science. If the trial doesn't make sense and it's not something that we understand, then it, it's often just a waste of money. So you know, to make progress in these re refractory and challenging cancers, I think we really, in most cases, have to have a good basic biologic understanding of them. And the only way to do that is by funding basic science. 
And that, that's a little hard to defend. Often basic science doesn't feel, you know, like it's obviously cancer research, you know, understanding how DNA chromosomes segregated meiosis, you know, what's that got to do with cancer? But, you know, it's these, the problem or the point is that basic science is unpredictable. How it will help us, we don't readily know, but we know that if we invest in it, we'll be glad we did. Another uh, area, key focus area, so the third is this focus on, on the usage of big data. So the National Cancer Institute has access to these tremendous data sets, but unfortunately, they're not sufficiently well organized for certain uses in research. So, um, and this is very frustrating to patients in the advocacy community. So for example, uh, I, I met with a, uh, a grandfather of a child who had cancer and this patient had gone to one of the premier you know, pediatric cancer hospitals in the world. And uh, they uh, had told uh, the grandfather, we're gonna treat your grandchild with this regimen based on this paper. And they handed him a paper that was a case report of about 25 patients because this kind of pediatric cancer is rare. And the grandfather asked his do the doctor, the pediatric oncologist, haven't more than 25 people in the world had this cancer? <laughs> and yeah, it's a couple hundred cases a year in the United States well, then why don't we know more about what happened to those other couple hundred patients? Why are we doing, you know, these very toxic aggressive therapies in, you know, the person I love most in the world based on such little information? And then, you know, the doctor had to sheepishly explain how clinical trials work in the United States and the barriers and problems that are probably wearily familiar to anyone in this audience who does clinical trials. But, you know, to a, a civilian, to a non-clinician doctor, you know, they pull out their cell phone and can get information on every hotel in North America in 35 seconds. But we can't find out what happened to these patients with cancer that we really want to know. And we'd really like to do a better job. So that is frustrating. And uh, why data aggregation? If those of you who remember Vice President Biden, who talked about the moonshot, spoke a lot on this topic. He was very fixated on why we aren't doing a better job of aggregating data and sharing data and getting rid of the silos. And now at the NCI, I've learned a lot about why this problem is so difficult. And it has to do with a lot of things. So part of it is there are these rules about sharing data. Data privacy and security is really important. Uh, manageable, but it does provide some challenges. Uh, there's also some resistance. You know, people have their research careers based on these data sets, and there's a little bit of data hoarding. Uh, that is a problem. I don't think it is as big a problem as people imagine, but it does exist. But to me, the biggest problem looks like it's just really hard. You know, these different data sets that were created by different people for different purposes over years, they don't really talk to each other. And so it's sort of Y2K on steroids for healthcare. And aggregating these data sets turns out to be really hard. And what the NCI has to do is a lot of sort of what looks like plumbing. We have to build these data sources that allow data sets to talk to each other. We have to have data ontologies to allow people to structure their data in a common way. We have to create, you know, cloud infrastructure so people can upload their data sets to a common place and compute on it. So it's a lot of stuff that's weedy and technical, but we've been doing it now for a while and it's getting better. You know, Bob Croyle today talked about the SEER program. You know, SEER is something that's been around since for 40 some years. It's this large aggregated uh, cancer registry data, but the SEER of today is not your grandfather's SEER registry anymore. It's taking on these incredible new capabilities that are exciting. And we have similar programs along genomic data, and the vision is this, you know, what we would like to have, what we have right now today is the Cancer Genome Atlas and the Genomic Data Commons. So there's this data set that lives in the cloud that any researcher can go to download. These are petabytes of data that have been downloaded by hundreds of thousands of individuals for cancer research, used with, for purposes that we never imagined or conceived in highly innovative ways. It's probably been the most studied data set in the history of, of, of medical research. But uh, it's just the genomic data. It's just the cancer name and the, the sequence of the patient's tumor. And wouldn't that data set be so much more useful if we had the clinical information, you know, who responded to therapy, who died of therapy, who was cured? If we had the radiolog radiologic data, like what did their CAT scan look like when they had this kind of pancreatic cancer? If we had the histology, if you could look at the images and say, oh, it's this sort of cribiform appearance or whatever those words pathologists like to use. You know, if we had all those data sets linked and interoperable and shareable and available to the research community in a way that was safe and secure, that would be so much better. And that's what we're working to build. And it's just really hard, but we're making progress. And the last uh, key focus area I identified, you know, informed directly by the experience of taking care of these patients 
and also having been a cancer center director, was to take on the vexing problem of clinical trials. So, you know, the NCI has been historically a really important funder of some of the most important paradigm changing clinical trials in cancer research. Uh, and, you know, one of the stories that Norm Wolmalk talked about today about how the NCI worked with the NSABP to really, uh, you know, modernize the care of breast cancer and colon cancer and other diseases. And, uh, but, you know, clinical trials are changing. The trials that we did even 10 years ago don't make sense anymore. You know, I, I mentioned this molecular characterization of tumors that mean we have to characterize these patients very exquisitely in, 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 in tremendous molecular detail. But that means that you can't just take all the patients and put them on one trial of the same drug. You know, now we have to personalize the therapy. We have to sequence all these genes and say, oh, you have this kind of breast cancer. And this kind of, you know, one in 50 patients with breast cancer have this kind of breast cancer. And so you need a treatment that's different from the other 98% of breast cancer patients. So these, these personalized trials are much better for the patients. They get much more effective therapy. It's much less toxic, but they're much harder to do. You know, to administer a clinical trial like that is more complicated. And so the NCI has had to modernize how we think about clinical trials. And we've already started to do a number of things. The first thing we decided to do is just a simple, uh, very uh, big government solution is just put more money into clinical trials. They were under-resourced and we, admit, we agree with that. And the NCI has been increasing our funding to the extent possible. And by the way, that has been possible because of the great support we've had from Congress. So in 2018, our budget was increased by $270 million. So that allows us to put a lot of money towards clinical trials, which was sorely needed. Another thing that we're doing is we're starting to focus on these innovative designs, the clinical trials that are more efficient and quicker, and that will be able to uh, provide endpoints on, you know, tens or hundreds of patients and not require thousands of patients. And then we're, you know, trying to learn from every patient. We're trying to aggregate data on, as we do these clinical trials and make sure that we can, you know, find out uh, every bit of information we can from these patients and make them more efficient. So that's, uh, you know, the, the, the key focus areas uh, of the NCI as I'm director. And there, there are areas, as I said, where the NCI has a real role to play, where we, no one else can sort of step into some of these breaches if we don't. So that's, uh, the, the, these three patients that I told you about have influenced me and taught me and, uh, and, and what th that information has done to how to run the National Cancer Institute. But I don't think you need an MD to understand, you know, the real joy of healing. When, when we heal our patients, you know, we learn from them and, and, and they heal us. It is a, a marvelous experience. And so let me close with that line from the Physician's Oath again. May you long experience the joy of healing those who seek our help. So thank you for the opportunity to come today, and thank you for a great visit. And I, I uh, expect and hope there will be questions about the NCI. If there are any, I'd be happy to take them with Richard's help. <laughs> As I said, often someone at this point stands up and asks me about their grant score, <laughs> which I've always loved that question. That's my favorite. The R01 number. That I don't know. <laughs> So, um, Ned, I really appreciate you being here. And I'm going to ask a question that, uh, that I've heard you answer in some ways. But give us your thoughts after being here. Uh, and we so appreciate you being here. And, Bob, you appreciate you being here, too. But talk about what we should be looking at in West Virginia. Um, that, because I think that that insight would be really helpful for all of us. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So I, I'm... First off, you know, I, I should say a lot of my training happened at Harvard Medical School, and then my uh, most of my faculty career was at the University of North Carolina. Those are two very different environments. They're both great. You know, Harvard was a wonderful place to train. I learned a lot. I have many good friends there. But I'm really a much, I was much happier at the University of North Carolina, because that was an institution that was committed to taking care of everybody. Charity care, whoever walked in the door, the whole state catchment area. Uh, you know, easy patients, hard patients, rich patients, poor patients. And it was, um, it's very exhilarating to know that you, you know, you're, you're going to do your best for everybody, regardless of their ability to pay or their, you know, their social circumstances. And so West Virginia reminds me of that it's my kind of place. I mean, it's an institution here of a, of a challenging, let's admit it, a challenging catchment area where there's a lot of poverty, 
there's a lot of alcohol abuse, there's smoking, there's obesity, you know, there are things that cause cancer and make this catchment area uh, at high risk for cancer and make the burden of cancer high in this state. But, you know, I admire, uh, as I said, this is my kind of place. I admire the esprit and the interest in getting things done for all your patients. So it's had been a great day. I think, you know, that then that backdrop gives some sense of where the opportunities are for, for West Virginia, because, you know, the NCI really doesn't need, you know, 70 or 80 cancer centers that look alike. You know, we, we actually would like to fund each one to have its thing, to ha have its unique area where it distinguishes itself and, and, and does something great. And West Virginia has an opportunity to work on this difficult question. Uh, it has many opportunities, but one in particular that strikes me is the opportunity to work on this difficult question of a rural cancer disparity. So as I pointed out earlier today, if you look at cancer disparities, and, and Bob Croyle was the one who first showed me this, uh, in 1993, if you were a patient living in an urban area, uh, you did less well with your cancer than a patient living in a rural area. And that was like the last time that was true. Ever since then, every year, there's been this increasing disparity where rural patients do less well with the same patient, pay cancer at the same stage than patients living in urban areas. And rurality is a complicated thing. It's you know, confounded by access to care and race and socioeconomic status and level of education and tobacco use. And, you know, I think I already said access, but that's so important, I'll say it twice. You know, so it, it, is, a, it is, a, is an interesting research problem as to why this disparity in cancer outcome occurs. And one the NCI is really interested in investigating. And, and West Virginia, you know, has an opportunity to study that question given the interesting catchment area. And how does, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, an emerging topic like e-cigarettes, you know, what does that mean in a rural population? And what does that, what kind of behaviors do that cause? And how, even if you have something that works, like, you know, think about this one, uh, cancer genetics is a germline genetics, you know, sequencing people is really growing very quickly, whether we want it to or not, because of, you know, do it yourself germline testing. You know, people are getting 23andMe, Ancestry.com, or whatever, and they're showing up at their surgeon saying, I have this mutation in BRCA1, I'd like a big surgery. <laughs> and some of the surgeons are saying, oh, whoa, wait a second, some are not. And, uh, but what we've learned is there are not enough cancer geneticists in the world to take care of the emerging need. And so how are we going to, but, you know, rural patients are going to have these tests too, and they may live hours away from the cancer center and the, can, the one cancer geneticist in the state. How are we going to do this? So, you know, that's going to be a real challenge the NCI is going to have to solve, and maybe telemedicine is an answer, maybe, uh, you know, some regulation of the test is an answer. We, we don't know. But, uh, you know, these, just because you have a therapy doesn't work, that works, you know, at a major cancer center doesn't mean it really works for the real world. And so these implementation science questions, I think, are a good fit. So I think there are a lot of great opportunities. And I, I, I think, um, you know, there's a clear commitment in the institution and, 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 and great leadership. Uh, my old boss standing beside me. So, uh, so I, I, I really am enthusiastic and pleased by the visit. Um, thank you, Dr. Sharpless, for your talk. I really love that you brought in those three patients. I think that that was really important for us to hear. Um, I'm the palliative care physician here at the Cancer Center, uh, so I have two things. First, I'm going to plug for my grant. <laughs> Please pick me about cancer health disparities and building an application, but that's an aside. So, what, so since the new opioid guidelines came out in 2016, it's been harder and harder to get patients the opioids they need. And yes, since cancer is turning into a chronic illness, we need to be stewards of opioids in general. But as I sit with my nurse clinicians and use an hour of each of their time to be on the phone advocating for patients, getting denials for opioids, where are we going to be taking care of our patients when I can't get my regimen done and, and the insurance companies say, well, you're just a palliative care doctor. What do you know about this? Yeah, How is the end? Well, th th thank you for that. <laughs> that is thank you for the question. I, I, there's a lot, lot to pick up there. So first of all, good luck on the grant. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
but let's let's talk about opioids for a second because I uh, share a lot of your concerns. And, and first, the first people to grab me and talk to me about this, this was like days within me starting my job, my new job, were the oncology nurses. You know, they have a big group that comes to DC, and and they had noticed exactly what you described that, you know, in the laudable goal of using less op opioids and being less, uh, you know, more thoughtful about how we prescribe opioids that many patients were starting to get these hassles where they would you know, get a prescription for 30 Percocet and then they would leave the pharmacy with five. You know, and there was very inadequate pain control in many of these patients. And it also has to be said, there are many patients with cancer pain who really need opioids. There really aren't great options for some of these patients. Uh, so this um, reaction nationally to what is a terrible pandemic is you know, not unfamiliar to this state, for example, uh, has caused a lot of worry and I have to say, as a medical oncologist, I don't think we were great at pain control even before this happened. I mean, it's always been an area where a lot of patients are undertreated. Uh, I think we do a good job in inpatients, but when they go home, you know, we often get the dose wrong. And, and so pain control can be challenging in medical oncology to begin with. So against that backdrop, um, there is a lot going on. Uh, one piece of good news is that Congress has appropriated $500 million for opioid research uh, in the latest budget. And uh, that includes uh, a lot of uh, scientific study for non-addicting analgesics. So, you know, that, that would be, I think everyone would be happy if we had pain drugs that worked through a different mechanism or with less toxicity than the ones that we had today that weren't opioids, for example. Uh, so that's a, a laudable goal that, you know, is decades away. Um, also, uh, there's been a creation or is in the process of creating a large sort of network for opioid, uh, I mean, for, for uh, cancer pain or pain studies uh, that will be, um, uh, you know, a, a way to do uh, trials of, of, of pain control in uh, larger settings. And uh, the NCI has been, uh, that's a trans NIH initiative, so it's not located in any specific NIH, but the NCI has been lobbying for a cancer pain study, you know, to try and get a large sort of maybe community-based study, perhaps through NCORE or something like that. And this is early days we're still discussing. But I, I think that, um, you know, that would be a great use of funds to balance the risk of addiction with the, you know, risk of undertreating cancer pain. Uh, and so those are two efforts. I think um, we have had a, uh, uh, I would say, a, a, a decent and growing portfolio in the areas of symptom management and palliative care. And I think the NCI has helped support some good research and some clinical research in this area. But I would agree with the premise that it's probably an area where the NCI could do more. And, uh, but it's a big problem. I can tell you that when I go speak to the Congress, which I do way more than I ever imagined, that's a good thing. I'm very impressed with the Congress. Uh, but um, the opioid epidemic is like healthcare item number one for many of the legislators. I mean, you know, if I say, but what about, you know, under treatment of pain, that is, that is a, a mere, you know, that's shouting in the wind right now. The, the entire energy is the other way about, you know, restricting access to pain and making it more difficult. So, uh, you know, we'll have meetings of all the NIH directors, you know, there are 27 NIHs talking about you know, the opioid epidemic and these kinds of things. And, and 26 of them are saying, you know, we need to crack down on opioids. And there's one, you know, the NCI director saying, but wait, wait, we're not doing a great job with pain control. So it, it is, um, it is going to be a challenging time for uh, uh, at least the use of op opioids in the community for a while. Uh, but, you know, I, I have to agree that the people who are trying to restrict opioid use have a point. The statistics are pretty terrible. Some of the best data in this regard actually comes from the NCI and DCEG. We have great statistics on mortality in the United States. And the, the, there has been a real epidemic of poisonings in the United States that are opioid related. And, and so it is a correct statement that we need to uh, find out how to use these medicines for the patients who need them and use them safely. Uh, hi, thank you for coming, first of all, to uh, WVU. But I wanted to ask, as a graduate student in a microbiology research lab, and with the emergence and uh, surgence of uh, cancer immunotherapies, where does the NCI stand on microbial-based cancer therapies? Um, and, and where do you think it, it's going? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think um, there's a, a, a lot, uh, you know, the, uh, the discoveries of the activity of immune-based therapies, both cellular immunotherapy and 
has really invigorated all things immunology, including uh, innate immunity. And uh, that has a lot to do with bacteria, it turns out. So there is a huge focus on microbiome research. We get uh, I've had a furious increase in the number of microbiome grants. I, I sort of you know joke that we're gonna have single cell microbiome sequencing is where we're going soon because that's the confluence of the two things we get uh, that are Protax, right? So Protax, uh, you know, those are the three big upsurges in, at the NCI funding portfolio. Um, we have also had a number of people talk to us about various therapies based on, you know, uh, phages, uh, oncolytic viruses, other uses of viruses and now even some bacteria. Uh, we heard a recent presentation about the use of listeria as an adjuvant for therapy. So this is exciting. I, I think um, it is one of those things, though, that I am uh, really, uh, really eager to see us not skip a step and just say, oh, it kind of works in a mouse. Let's do a big clinical trial. You know, these are very complicated. A, a, a microorganism is a complicated thing as an adjuvant. And we really have to understand how they work and would there be a simpler way to do that? You know, if they're just a, a fancy way of acting, fading toll-like receptors, then we, you know, want to understand that before investing in clinical trials. But it, I, I think it's a really exciting uh, area and I commend you for working on a good topic because you know, it's a good career choice. So, yeah, but uh, stay tuned. I think there'll be more. Yeah. Thank you for your talks today. Um, I am involved with clinical trials as I talked to you at lunchtime today. I've been in clinical trials for 20 years, um, 18 of them in cancer, the last four in West Virginia. Came from a larger urban environment in Case Western and Cleveland. We all have struggled in all 20 years that we have not been able to shift enrollment in clinical trials past that three to five percent. And I've been doing a little bit more research and thinking about this, what we're doing, and one of the talks I gave last week at the Fall Cancer Conference concentrated that one of our big issues was access to care or access to the trials. I know you talked about ur rural, uh, rural and urban health disparities, and they have a, a recent paper that's logged in at their analytics where they analyzed 40,000 patients and compared it. And they're really, if they took away that they were on that clinical trial, there was not a health disparity for those rural patients compared to the urban patients out of the 17 diseases, just one of those. So we have that proven issue. They're on clinical trials. They, usually that disparity is neutralized. So with our rural health population, we have to bring these trials to them. Berg mentioned the easiest pipeline to get them in these trials are NCI-sponsored trials, but that's usually at a money loss for an academic center. So how do you see the NCI helping us bring this access to care and access to clinical trials to the rural environment? Yeah, I mean, this topic requires a whole hour talk on its own. Um, I will react to a few things you said. So first off, I've been looking for the source of this 3 to 5% number, and I can't find it. <laughs> I say it, I've actually used it myself, but it's, it's unclear what actually is the enrollment on clinical trials in the United States. I think we would all agree it's low and uh, hasn't improved as much as we would have liked and may even be getting worse. I, I think those are all fair statements. Um, accrual is low for a lot of reasons. I, I do think there's pretty good research on why accrual is low. Um, and a big limitation is access. You know, if it is a hassle to be on a clinical trial, if you have to take a day off of work, you have to drive three hours, you have to pay for parking, you know, you have to go to a hospital where you don't know anybody and you, you know, it's scary and big, uh, you're not going to go on a clinical trial, right? So I, I think that that is uh, uh, well established. And some of the other reasons that People have said we don't enroll in clinical trials probably turn out to not be true, that most of it is, you know, these, these sort of logistical issues because people with cancer have to live their lives. So, uh, uh, so what can we do about accrual? A couple of things. So one thing, one point I like to make is look at the NCI match trial. You know, there's been a lot of focus on whether the, you know, agents work and the efficacy of these various arms of the NCI match trial. And I should mention the NCI match trial was a large trial conducted by the National Cancer Institute where we enrolled patients based on molecular genetics. So if you had a tumor that didn't have a standard of care, you'd failed standard therapy and it was advanced cancer, we would sequence your cancer in one of these central labs we created and based on the results of that sequencing, assign the patient to one of sort of 30 plus arms of therapy. And the important thing there was we enrolled that uh, at lots of sites, not just the major cancer centers. We used our in-core network, you know, which allowed enrollment at 900 different sites across the country. And uh, that trial, which provided novel therapeutics to patients often in a community setting, enrolled 6,000 patients at 1,100 sites and finished accrual two years ahead of schedule. 
is the fastest accruing trial in the history of NCI. And I like to point out it was all my idea. No, <laughs> it actually started years before I came. But, uh, but you know, that's the good thing about NCI director. What, if it happens on your watch, you own it, right? The, the good and the bad. But uh, so, so the NCI match trial is, a, I think, from that point of view, a success because it teaches you that a lot of these accrual issues can be solved by interesting trials that are available in the community that don't force people to drive three hours to go to some new cancer center. How do we get, uh, so that's incumbent on us. We have to write well-designed trials that are available uh, at, at you know, novel settings. Uh, the last thing you mentioned was the, um, the cost of clinical trials. And I think those of you who don't know these data would be shocked to see how much the per patient accrual costs on a cancer or any clinical trial in the United States, but particularly a cancer clinical trial, have gone up over the last two decades. It's more than fourfold. And uh, you know, certainly the NCI reimbursement per patient has not gone up at a similar rate. And the uh, delta between what a pharmaceutical company will pay for a patient and what a NCI trial will pay has grown during that period. And we are aware of that. And that's bad. You know, Putting your patients on an NCI trial should not be a philanthropic act. <laughs> so we are trying to fix that. Um, last year, we put $10 million of 2018 money into the NCTN trials. I uh, hope and expect we will do that in 2019 and maybe even beyond that if Congress allows with budget support. Uh, that will never get the NCI up to the, the pharma numbers, but it will decrease the delta sum such that uh, it won't be such a losing proposition. But um, uh, the last thing I'll say about clinical trials is really interesting is if you really think about it, you know, matching people to trials is a data problem. I mean, this is a big data issue because you need to know two things about a clinical trial. You know, you need to know about the universe of clinical trials that are open and enrolling patients at what stage and with what eligibility criteria. And that is a much harder question than you would believe. You know, clinicaltrials.gov does not cut it for that purpose, right? And then, because, you know, who, who among us hasn't had a patient show up at our center for a clinical trial and we don't have a slot, you know, or something like that? The most frustrating experience uh, to patients and doctors imaginable. But then you also need to know a different data set, which is the sort of all the information from that patient's medical record. You need to know, you know, do they have a brain metastasis? Do they have liver function tests? You know, this kind of stuff. And then you have to intersect those two data sets in a way that says this patient is, should, the best trial for him is over, you know, here for this, 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 this setting. And uh, that is an area that I think we can improve. I think if we can help build some infrastructure for clinical trials matching at both ends, then um, uh, we would do a much better job. And we'd help accrual, but we'd also help our patients by getting them on more effective trials that are better suited for them. So that's the kind of uh, you know, big data exercise where the NCI can help. And if we can figure that out, available to everybody doing clinical trials and, and hopefully we'll uh, increase accrual. But we really need to work on accrual. I agree it's a problem. I think it's particularly a problem for certain underserved vulnerable populations like rural populations uh, such as this state serves. I'd like to ask the last Okay. Question. I'm going to ask you as a former cancer center director, now somebody who makes decisions about funding cancer centers, what is your position? Uh, so I'll start again. I, I, I'm asking that as a former cancer center director, uh, and now somebody who reviews the cancer center grants and determines whether cancer centers get funded. How a place like us, who has a big ambition but scarce resources gets to where we need to be to have the momentum uh, to get a grant. Uh, and you know, at UNC, the state legislature was amazing and gave UNC the University Cancer Research Fund, uh, which is $50 million a year to fund cancer research. It's a very successful uh, cancer center uh, with lots of grants and uh, a comprehensive uh, School of Public Health and School of Pharmacy that contributes. We're so much smaller, and I struggle every day with how are we going to get critical mass. So I'd love your advice. Sure. A um, couple of things to say there. I think uh, the uh, first thing to know about it, a common misconception about the cancer. Well, let me even start further back than that. So uh, the NI, NCI is sort of like the only NIH that has this kind of a center program. So, it, you know, uh, other big IC institutes and centers at the NIH um, don't have a program. They have their center grants, but they're often, you know, things that the NCI would think of as PO1s, you know, smaller, multi, you know, investigator grants. But the 
the, the, the sort of structure that is the CCSG, the Cancer Center Support Grant, is just far into all other ICs except for the NCI. And so it's been an interesting thing to learn. You know, since I'd grown up in the cancer center world, I kind of assumed, you know, everybody had, you know, disease centers for whatever disease, but they don't. This is unique to the NCI. The Cancer Center Program was created by the National Cancer Act in 1971 by Richard Nixon. And uh, if we didn't have it, we'd have to create it. It's a very, very important program. It gives us a way to get reach into the community and get information from the community uh, that is very vital to the NCI. It gives us um, uh, just a number of uh, relevant skills related to basic science and clinical translation and uh, you know, novel advice. So it's, it's, a, it's a great program and really one of the important things that the National Cancer Center expensive program. So it is, uh, you know, 70 NCI designated centers. Uh, the core grants are all in the order of millions of dollars a year. So you can sort of do the math in your head and realize what portion of our budget it is. So, um, uh, so it, it, we have to be uh, uh, very careful uh, because generally when a place becomes a, a center, it's rare for it to be decentered, if you will. And, and so uh, the barrier has to be quite high for this expensive program. And that's the way it's grown up. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of places that would like NCI designation and they all come to the NCI asking exactly that question. You know, what could we do to accelerate our progress? And, and the only way I have to answer that is just to sort of talk about, you know, what the features are of recently successful centers. And if you look at these centers, there are places that have made a tremendous investment to cancer research and cancer clinical care in the form of recruiting new young faculty, in the form of investing in infrastructure like new hospitals and new infusion centers and new capabilities, uh, new radiation oncology facilities, for example. So. Uh, and, uh, and uh, a real commitment to cancer science. And also, I think the best of them have figured out, you know, what problem, as I said, we don't want 70 centers that all look the same. You know, what problem are we best suited to address for uh, the, the national need on cancer? And that, that's how you make the argument that the NCI really needs to fund you, is by saying, we are the right place to do research in this specific question. So if you were in Oklahoma, you would argue that you have this catchment area that includes lots of American Indians, the statistics for American Indians and cancer are not good. It's an area the NCI would like to do better, and Oklahoma makes sense as a means to address that important disparity. So uh, that's what I would recommend. You know, it, 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 it is the cancer, it, it, the common misconception I was about to say is that we provide grants so you can build a center, and it's the opposite. We provide grants to reward you for having built a good center, right? So. It requires a village, a tremendous commitment from the hospital, from the state usually, from philanthropy, you know, a lot of hustle. It takes a long time and it requires, uh, you know, this sort of ruthless focus on what, what's special about us? What's the problem we're best able to solve and why does the NCI need to fund us? And uh, if you can focus on that, then uh, it's a lot easier. So your advice is to be ruthless. Well, you know, yes, <laughs> that is my advice. I mean, I, I will say, uh, you know, they, they, it has to be said, I will just make an observation that the places that do this successfully prioritize cancer over other problems. You know, you can have a neuroscience center, you can have a heart and vascular center, you can have a, you may not be able to have all three. So it requires tough choices. Thanks. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to the Friends of the Hardesties for sponsoring this event.